Terrific. Welcome, everyone. I'm really delighted today to introduce John Bridges as our guest speaker today. Dr. Bridges is an associate professor in the Department of Health Management and International Health at the Johns Hopkins Blue Book School of Public Health. His broad research agenda employs qualitative and quantitative methods to study priorities and preferences of patients and other stakeholders to explore research questions in both clinical medicine and public health. He's an internationally recognized leader in both the methods and the applications of conjoint analysis in health. He's received numerous awards for his research, as well as for his generous contributions in the areas of teaching and mentoring. In his spare time, he's also founded a new journal, well, not so new anymore, um, that, and has served as founding editor of the journal, The Patient, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research. He's been a pioneer in building a professional community for those of us who study patient preferences, and that's how I met Dr. Bridges more than 10 years ago. He received his PhD in economics from the City University of New York. Prior to moving to the US, he received his undergraduate degree in economics from Australian National University and a master's in economics from the University of Sydney. We're really pleased to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bridges. How are you? Did, did that one turn on? I have to see if the, there we go. Okay. Um, Lisa, thank you very much for those very kind words and uh, for the opportunity to come out. And also, we've been trying to work out when I first got the invite to come, I said, when would it be warm? And Lisa said this week. And so I've been trying to work out how did you make this decision? But it turns out that it's six weeks since Groundhog Day. So I'm not sure if you're a believer in Groundhog prognostications, but um, we'll put it down to that. Whilst I generally work on patient preference um, research, I, about a third of my time is spent on health services uh, type of research uh, using econometric techniques. I've done a number of uh, research projects on ho hospital quality. Um, and this is an example of that type of research. Um, it's also an example of research where I've worked with uh, clinicians and other health services researchers to understand uh, um, and develop new methods um, for an important uh, contribution. So the focus is on systematic overuse and really applies a range of uh, benefit risk techniques to un identify which interventions are fit into this portfolio. But I really want to focus in this presentation about the different steps that we took um, to identify why we think the Johns Hopkins overuse index is a marker of a systematic underlying um, a phenomena within the uh, and across healthcare systems. It was originally funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation a couple of years ago. Oh, we're struggling to find uh, new funding for this, which would be uh, um, great, but uh, we've actually uh, done uh, some pretty nice papers associated with this. Jody Siegel, who has been the PI on the project, and my doctoral student, Moju, um, is working on this particular paper. This is the first time it's being presented. Uh, it's the paper that we're going to give at the conferences over the summer. So this is very early on. Um, so uh, I'd be very open to comments and, and criticisms of the approach that we're moving forward. And it really is work in progress. And I'd also like to thank the contributors to the previous papers, which will kind of be tied into the, the work here. And I'll kind of give the narrative of, of how this work developed and the different stages that we approached. The three aims of the presentation will be to present the conceptual model and the underlying axioms uh, that we believe a measure of systematic overuse should adhere to. We'll discuss how we developed the Johns Hopkins overuse index and how we did some early proof of principles um, associated with why we think that it's systematic overuse. And then we will focus on the ex exploratory analysis of looking at the potential drivers or structural features associated with systematic overuse in the United States. So the background. We all know the, the uh, high cost um, of healthcare in the United States, um, that this is clearly uh, not associated with the quality of care. I think the, the work of the Dartmouth group has been very clear of that, um, but also people like Barbara Starfield at Hopkins ha have really demonstrated the need to understand this uh, cost outcomes chasm 
uh, this disparities is also reflected internationally. Uwe Reinhardt and Jerry Anderson and others have, have really been clear to say that the amount of expenditures that we have in the United States uh, just don't warrant the outcomes. And there are limitations associated with this. I've had an opportunity to um, uh, work in different countries and, and different settings and there is on the margin, you can think about some explanations, but the sheer magnitude of, of the cost differences um, for the outcomes that we have require some more global uh, kind of understanding of, of this phenomenon. The predominant approach to do this has been the geographical variation or small area variation um, by Wenberg and others. Uh, this has been a much uh, often cited uh, approach to explain the cost out outcomes disparities um, and the work of Elliot Fisher and others have really focused in on the whether it's supply sensitive or not and preference sensitive. I have a little bit of difficulty understanding the different associations um, with that. Um, I, I, I'm trying to, to think about this as a more system-wide approach. Um, this said, uh, the, the, uh, a, a long literature um, focusing on the impact of geographical variations and its associations with measures of overuse, measures of underuse, measures of misuse, or other types of criteria have systematically always come back as having very little correlation. So whilst the uh, geographical variation in expenditures has intuitive appeal when you try and unravel the onion, as it were, it's very hard to understand why it is the case. And some recent research by uh, Mathematica has kind of indicated that potentially the, the confounding of um, severity and ge uh, um, uh, demographic variables has, has not really been fully accounted for um, in the traditional Dartmouth types of measures. So m much of the, the, the conversation uh, in recent years has been focused on that if there's such a big difference between costs and outcomes that there must be systematic uh, or widespread overuse of healthcare services and the gradient red berg led to the whole kind of less is more type of a uh, um, approach. Manuel and Fuchs talk about a potential perfect storm of influences in the United States um, that say that it's so ubiquitous across the whole system that, that it's just part and parcel of the US healthcare system will actually show that, uh, th that it's not as uniform and that there actually is variation and that's going to be one of the objectives of the work. Unfortunately, the study of o underuse um, when you compare all types of variation types of model still remains to be an understudied topic. Um, and many of the interventions that have claimed to be targeting small area variations have really focused on uh, fixing underuse problems of appropriate screenings and, and other quality types of metrics. The vast majority of them focus on providing care where care is not uh, usually uh, um, up to par with guidelines. And any efforts to control overuse, uh, such as recalibrating uh, um, the guidelines for breast cancer, um, these remain controversial. And when we first gave this presentation at um, Grand Rounds in general internal medicine, um, you know, the, universally in the room, I said, like, you can't say that it's overuse. We don't overuse. We know what we're doing. And what we're trying to do here is very much kind of stand back and say, we're not doing this. You as a doctor, when we're not saying that you're overusing. What we're saying is, there's something in the culture, in the healthcare system. There are other determinants of overuse that make a pattern in the United States. And what we want to go and do is show that we can actually measure that um, in our research. When I went to write the grant, I looked up in the Oxford English Dictionary the first application of the word overuse. And remarkably, it comes and has been attributed to a physician in the United Kingdom called John Cotter, and in the 7th cent 17th century, first used the term to talk about the rash and ignorant use of healthcare um, services 
in um, the, the, the time. Mainly he was talking about quackery and potions and bloodletting and this. Um, but needless to say, he, he was, uh, for publishing a, a six-page leaflet, was shunned by the medical community and became an outcast. Um, so we've got at least 400 years of precedent um, saying that this is a very difficult topic to work on. There are two broad ways to f define overuse. One approach is the absence of evidence type of definition that's been uh, suggested by the Institute of Medicine. Um, this is not necessarily uh, um, beneficial because we can't always help having uh, gaps in evidence. The approach that we're taking in this uh, work is more favors the approach uh, taken or prescribed to by ARC, where they say that it really is a situation where the potential for harm exceeds the potential for benefit. And that's the kind of linchpin to my, the vast majority of my uh, um, preference research where I'm continually focusing on optimal or patient-centered benefit risk ratios. All of the measures that we will suggest today have somehow implicitly applied a benefit risk uh, um, ratio. Sometimes that's included just harm, sometimes the agency is focused on costs, um, sometimes they're just focused on risks. We're gonna kind of take a holistic harm versus benefit, but we're not going to get down to the level of the minutia where the actual measuring of the harms and benefit make that much, uh, we don't make that much difference. So we can use a broad umbrella and then use some criteria to whittle away uh, um, the approaches and I'll, I'll describe uh, what I mean by that. So how could we conceptualize systematic overuse in the healthcare system? Uh, again, this problem of narrowly uh, focusing on specific populations for specific um, clinical scenarios, this my patients differ than your patients, you don't understand, you don't come to my clinic. Um, essentially, the proper diagnosis of overuse versus underuse is so resource intensive, it's probably better just to, 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 to let the service go by. We don't have the capacity to proper clinical information systems to verify each case. And even if we did, we're talking about potentially interventions that are low cost and just the search costs and the the um, burden to, to measure this becomes fundamentally a very expensive exercise to, to do that. What we wanna do here is refocus the debate on more an underlying um, phenomena, what we call systematic overuse. And by doing this, avoid the complexities, the minutia, the debate, uh, the challenge to clinical authority um, involved in taking a single measure in a single patient population. So we're kind of going to the polar extremes and looking at the 30,000 view uh, um, on a healthcare system and essentially say, can we measure at a very broad level whether one healthcare system is overusing or has a tendency to overuse more than another healthcare system? We do this by positing that individual instances of overuse on a, within a healthcare system is not necessarily a problem in of itself, but a symptom of an underlying potentially culture or structure within the healthcare system. And that we could potentially do this and define it by focusing on geographical environments. We could also go to, to small areas like particular healthcare institutions, but again, the, we wanna stay as far away from the individual clinician while we're making our proof of principles. To do this, we have essentially uh, this idea that we could say that there is a basket or a portfolio or a list of candidate interventions that we call potentially overused procedures. And I'll go and I'll show you exactly how we calculate an overused procedure. We're not counting all the times that that procedure is being used. We're essentially finding those times where given the current uh, standards or literature that it's believed that these interventions, the harms outweigh the benefits. So in the specific subpopulation of use, what instances 
um, if they're truly trying to apply some of the quality metrics uh, of Sentinel events or, uh, you know, I, I described this when I was talking to, to, the, to the clinician about these are really like lightning strikes that, that they're, they're sending signals that we want to try and pick up on. If we could do this, there would be two other symptoms associated with this kind of latent concept of systematic overuse. And that would be if a healthcare system had rampant uh, a systematic overuse, then it should cost more. Um, and then it could cost more and have better outcomes. And then we would be into the kind of traditional cost effectiveness uh, um, type of, of language. What we'd want to do is costing more with no benefit and outcomes. Um, and potentially uh, thinking about uh, um, the potential harms associated with overuse that we could potentially have um, uh, poorer healthcare outcomes in those areas uh, that have systematic overuse. Within the research team, we never quite agreed on the null hypothesis there, whether it should be a zero correlation or, or a negative correlation. So this is the kind of image approach. We uh, put forward a kind of Don Abedian structure of structure, process, and outcomes. And we really see the process in the process there that there's this systematic overuse as part of the process and that the procedures, the actual overuse of these procedures is an outcome um, of the this kind of negative process, not necessarily the process themselves. So we kind of move this into a kind of different framework. Uh, the structure of uh, systematic overuse could have patient level variation, systematic level variation, that's the approach that we're doing there. But then we're also focusing here on that there could be a potential large amount of random variation, that these measures may be inaccurate, um, they may not be an appropriate signal and that's where we are going to apply, um, from, from an economics point of view, this notion of developing a portfolio of interventions that would act as, uh, as essentially the proxy um, for systematic overuse. This is best seen in this diagram. We could think about these as having uh, each individual intervention. This is a range of interventions. And we can, interventions could be on an outcome plane. They could either have improved outcomes or poorer outcomes. They could lead to lower costs or they could lead to higher costs. In here, we kind of have the no-brainer quadrant um, that this, this is a really good idea. This is cost-saving interventions. We could move over somewhere in there. We're going to have a cost-effectiveness threshold that will change us from no-brainer maybe into things that we should use with caution but if we get up into the top quadrant, we wouldn't want to find uh, interventions with poorer outcomes and higher costs. They're the really bad ideas. These things are measured with error. If you've ever seen a cost effectiveness analysis and seen that point as the central tendency and then the kind of probability ellipse around that, they're generally really, really big. So we're not quite sure whether that lies there or up there or down here. But if we take as the dotted line um, takes there, a number of interventions, then that individual error associated with each of the interventions, whether that be measurement error or heterogeneity in patient populations, that will diminish and we'll kind of get the average effect associated with this. We did this by a focusing a proof of principle by taking um, six potentially overused procedures from the Choosing Wisely initiative. These were used in 2008 Medicare data. I'll describe that data more fully because that's where the main empirical results were going. And we're essentially going to regress this um, intervention. So this is, was the Choosing Wisely indicator overused? And that's going to be regressed on some patient characteristics, an individual specific indicator for the six um, variables that were of, in, of interest. And this is the regional effect, the regional fixed effect that we think captures the systematic component. If there is an underlying latent variable that's causing these interventions to be overused in a healthcare system relative to another uh, a healthcare system, then this fixed effect should capture um, that approach. If we look 
at what we find empirically, um, we take each of the individual six uh, um, indicators that we have taken from choosing wisely. Two of them turned out to be a bad idea, but one has potential outcomes for potential cost and has um, some adverse events, but potentially at some cost savings. So we don't have everything in there. They're the, um, the, um, the six blue dots um, there, are the blue triangles, are the individuals taken uh, one at a time. But when we pool the data and pull out the systematic effect, now this is not averaging, we haven't pooled them together. We accommodate for the individual characteristics with the measure specific fixed effects. And now we're just looking at the systematic component that these six interventions point to. When we take that parameter estimate across the 306 interventions, we see that in total, that accounts for much higher costs or is correlated with much higher cost and much poorer outcomes. Actually much worse, the combination of the six is much worse uh, in the cost effectiveness plane than any one of the interventions by themselves. So how did we move forward to developing and testing the Johns Hopkins overuse index? Essentially we had to go through a process of synthesizing the literature about all of these potentially overused procedures. And here we focused on a number of repositories, um, measured developers, uh, relevant initiatives, including the Choosing Wisely and the um, uh, American College of Physicians Cost Conscious Care Initiative. And then we also looked at the published literature. We questioned whether we needed to trawl the cost effectiveness database. Uh, I think we left that off in the, in the final um, instance so we didn't go in for just the cost effectiveness ratio. Most of these are defined on harm versus um, outcome, but sometimes some cost element was in associated with that harm. Uh, we excluded interventions because we wanted to make this index estimatable in Medicare claims data. Uh, essentially, for a first pass, we only chose those that were relevant to people age 65 and over. We didn't have the drug data, although it's questionable whether we would have wanted the drug data anyway. Um, and then uh, also discarded those that have difficult to implement items. So there might be some information that we needed to know like uh, um, serum levels and there might be some indicator of that, but it's so unreliable that we didn't know, say for example, the cholesterol of the patient. Um, so we, we're trying to find those that are easy to identify and operationalize in Medicare claims data. Our initial uh, scan of the literature um, and of practice identified 613 potentially overused procedures um, by the time we identified those that would be feasible to be estimated and relevant to our patient population, we got down to 35 uh, procedures. 22 of these were diagnostic, seven were screening, and six were therapeutics. And they ranged, um, although there was some focus on cancer and cardiology and radiology, it ranged from a, a, a broad range of interventions. And some of these were of trivial cost. We didn't use cost or burden or potential harm as a criteria for judging whether these were important or not. To see how these were used um, in, and varied in the um, healthcare system, we selected a 5% uh, sample in the 2008 combining uh, parts A and B claims data and we use the hospital referral region, the Dartmouth indicator, as our unit um, of observation. We could have done other units of observation, um, but this seemed to be work as a, as a first cut. We defined within our data set the patient population uh, who should not receive the inter intervention. Um, so it's kind of like we count all the interventions, unlike a, a um, Dartmouth indicator such as um, cabbage, we're not going to count all the cabbages, we're only going to find, cabbage isn't on our list by the way, uh, and we're only going to find interventions that uh, sh shouldn't be on the list and I'll show you how that's identifiable using ICD-9 codes. 
Um, and then uh, the analysis here is we really want to go in and do some frequency analysis to see how these um, uh, focus in our patient population. Here is an example. I'm not a clinician, um, so I'll try and do my best not to mess up the terms here. Wound cultures for a patient with chronic wounds. Essentially, we defined the at-risk population of who should potentially not be um, having this intervention, and then we get the subset of people who actually had a procedure that was indicative of having wound culture, and then we essentially combine those to find these pings, as it were, or instances or lightning strikes where this, now we could have de defined this tighter or looser um, with, with regards to clinical specificity, um, but essentially this is a general measure and we go through and do this for all 35 uh, measures. Here's a, another one there. Um, there's a number of ENT interventions um, that we go through there, again, defining the at-risk population who shouldn't be receiving this and then identifying the subset of people who actually had the procedure. What was our uh, strategy for item reduction? Essentially, we operationalized all 35 procedures um, in our data set and essentially deleted any that were too common and there were three cancer screening um, uh, interventions that were defined by age that we're all familiar with. We determined that they happened with too great a frequency to be, um, they were driving our, our index too much. Um, they were too infrequent, um, for example, uh, cardiac CT for a cardiac mass. There was only six of these identified in our intervention. That's not a good measure. The kind of standard rule of thumb is that it really should be happening at least with cell sizes of about five in each cell, and that's just too, too rare. Um, they were too skewed. Um, so for example, an allergy test with sinusitis, there was too much distribution um, associated that really long tail. Uh, we wanted to uh, um, get something that varied a little bit more um, across the scale and where there were potentially too many measures. So we deleted one criteria. Jody, uh, my colleague, asked how many, in, how many stocks make a, a, a portfolio or how many things should you put a portfolio? And I said, I, from memory, I studied finance theory when I did economics at 20, and so we ended up with a few too many, and so we dropped a, a couple of that just to kind of balance, um, essentially because we had too many e ENT and radiology interventions, so we dropped a couple of there. Our final index was identified um, by 20 uh, indicators. Um, these are them. Uh, I wanted never to show these, because whenever we go to a, um, a health insurance company or to a state provider and we show these, they've gone, this is great, can we have the algorithm that identifies this, we can put it into the electronic medical record and make pop-ups. I was like, that's not what we're doing here. We're not saying, well, it's not accurate enough. We haven't gone in and validated each one of these indicators. Essentially what we're trying to do is generate a portfolio of these and find the systematic uh, um, component. But those of you who are clinicians will see that a number of these uh, make quite clinical um, sense. N not many of them are never ever events. Um, they're generally some variation uh, uh, associated with them. How do we measure, again, the systematic component? We'll use the same uh, strategy associated with identifying the individual effects, um, risk adjust, uh, there was a lot of debate whether we should risk adjust these. It turns out that the risk adjustment is extremely minor. Um, that the risk adjusted and the non-risk adjusted versions, the correlation between those two indices is something like 0.98. Um, I think uh, the, the R squared or the pseudo R squared in the risk adjustment model was less than 10%. It was like a very, very faint uh, um, effect and really if we had, had done risk adjustment or not done risk adjustment, or we could have calculated this score using other approaches like gone straight to a Z score, um, a la Luft and Romano in the, in, in the quality literature, uh, we essentially continue to get the same results as we're presenting in this specification. However, this has some econometric appeal to identifying that systematic component while 
isolating um, the error component, which is generally when you use um, a, a z-score type of approach initially, that error component sucked in with the, um, with, with the systematic component. Another trick that we did um, doing this, because in the sample we have about 1.4 million observations, uh, there was the possibility that some people could have these interventions, uh, POPs, more than once. For each in individual, we're only going to count one POP. So essentially, if you had one uh, CT when you shouldn't have done it, if you had three of them, we're still only going to count that at the individual level just once. Um, but you could have more than one of these 20 POPs for a given person. To accommodate that, essentially what we're going to do is make panel data in the data set and only keep those patient populations that this could potentially happen to. So if it was defined by gender, for example, we weren't going to keep the wrong gender in there when we were doing the model. So essentially we made parsimonious data sets for each one um, of the 20 procedures and then we just stacked them on top of one another to accommodate uh, essentially panel data style. Um, the, the estimation of the systematic component. If this measure, if this, if this uh, delta um, K that we're estimating, if that generates a set of um, fixed effects and we truly believe that they are indicative of this latent concept that we call um, systematic overuse, then we believe that there should be at least four criteria that we can use to prove that this index is what we say it is. First of all, it should vary. If it didn't vary, then it's very, um, it still could be systematic overuse, but it would be hard to identify it. There were some people when we went through peer review that were very clear that this thing wasn't going to vary, that it, it, across the US, overuse was identical. And I think that that comes from that kind of perfect storm where you're subject to the same rules it turns out empirically not to be the case. We also should think that this would be costly. If this wasn't costly, then it wouldn't be overuse. Um, it wouldn't be associated with waste or efficiency. There's two possible hypotheses that either the Hopkins index is associated with poorer health outcomes or at least not associated with better health outcomes. Um, and that's two potential hypotheses that we could have there. Another indicator that's really important is that we're not just picking up small area variation. Um, if we made a measure that was more complicated and just essentially had the same variation as um, the indicators that are on the Dartmouth Atlas, um, then that wouldn't contribute anything. So essentially we're going to compare that. We're going to make a corresponding index uh, with uh, knee, knee arthroplasty, hip, um, PTCA and cabbage as a kind of uh, simple um, alternative um, hypothesis. And it turns out also that uh, this index does not have the same relationship um, with the costs and outcomes that would indicate it's a measure of systematic overuse, but we want to show that we're independent from that measure. So as I mentioned, we uh, applied this in the 5% sample, 1.4 million observations, 88% were white, 7.3 uh, black, the other races filled in the remainder. Um, across the 20 uh, POPs in our data set, 14% uh, of the individuals in the data set had experienced at least one overused procedure uh, during 2008. This rate varied substantially across the 306 um, HHRs, uh, ranging from 8.4 all the way up to 27%. At the individual level, um, in this panel data structure, holding constant, not double counting any given procedure, but for an individual, they could have from zero, but some individuals all the way up to potentially having seven of these pops, seven different pops happening um, to them within the calendar year, which is arguing for that, why we needed that panel data um, structure that we kind of artificially made out of the data set. Um, we standardized, risk adjusted the, the index and essentially turned it into a standardized index and this normalized index ranged from negative um, uh, two all the way up to four. And even though there's a, some skew uh, right here, it, essentially the kurtosis of the, the data set is about what you would expect um, for a normally distributed test statistic. 
uh, we could have potentially logged it, but there wasn't sufficiently skewed um, to, to warrant logging. Um, from this data set, there are essentially statistically about three under users compared to the US national average, and there were nine statistically significant over users, but then there was some, a, a range um, in, in that uh, statistic. Here is a density um, function uh, using the kind of uh, variation um, that we go there. And, and essentially the, the, the very strong, this is an unstandardized version of the index um, ranging uh, from, from uh, the z-scores that we generated. Um, it is a marked variation in this. If we have a look at the uh, top and the, the lowest, there starts to be a little bit of an intuitive pattern. The high density areas um, on the coasts uh, are, are kind of doing that in some rural areas. Um, Ann Arbor was 53rd uh, lowest. Um, so pre pretty much in there, Hopkins turned out to be 134th lowest, which was below the average, but uh, I'm still a little bit overusing. Uh, here is the variation with costs. When we look at that, there is actually a statistically positive relationship um, between costs and overusing. So the more you overuse, the more you cost. So this is not, uh, people are not using this as some form of rational way to, to save money. It's potential that they generated some work out around. This doesn't seem to be the case um, at, at a systematic level. When we look at health um, outcomes, uh, essentially here, the indicator is going to be a measure of negative um, uh, health outcomes or adverse events. The mortality rate measured at 30 days is used as a kind of broad quality metric um, for the, the outcome and it too is positively correlated. So those uh, that are more frequently uh, overusing as identified by the index have a higher mortality rate. Um, the relationship if we use all cause mortality is ambiguous in sign uh, um, associated with this. But again, all cause mortality has not really been accepted as a good quality indicator of the healthcare system because it has so many other determinants, um, socioeconomic health structure and other social services impact it. We also find um, no relationship or no correlation, or it's very, very, very low um, correlation. I think the correlation coefficient is something like 0 0.014 um, between the index. And essentially, we com developed this competing index of the Dartmouth measures and used all the statistical procedures that we used uh, um, for creating the overuse index and uh, the, these are not there. So in selecting those 20 procedures as opposed to the four that are usually uh, advocated by Dartmouth, um, there's one ambiguous there, the um, lower back pain, which happens to be in our index. That's why we didn't add it um, to, to the Dartmouth indicator. Um, so apart from that one, there doesn't seem to be uh, much overlap between these two indices and the hypothesis uh, associated with our index being correlated with cost and correlated with poor outcomes is not replicated by the Dartmouth index. So how could we uh, move forward in essentially thinking about the determinants of, of um, overuse? When we first set out in the first conceptualization of this, i.e. in the grant, um, we said that uh, if, if we're going to generate a relevant measure of systematic overuse, it better be explained by something. We had this uh, hypothesis called explainable. Um, essentially, if it varied um, but didn't vary with anything that we knew, um, then it's pretty hard to say that something's causing it. So in this paper, what we want to, or this part of the paper, or what's our next empirical paper, um, we're trying to identify some potential determinants or correlates uh, associated with this to show that there is some variation with this index and it's not just some random variable that we've come across that happens to be correlated with cost and outcomes. Uh, in the presence of a perfect storm of factors impacting the US, it might be a little bit difficult to conceptualise what factors might lead to overuse. There really isn't been that much uh, determinants of, of overuse um, uh, in the, the, the kind of uh, 
paralleling, for example, what, what is known or what was known early about the quality literature, we had some kind of tests that we had such as the volume outcome relationship and other things that could uh, use, be used as a proxy to test the quality indicators. Here it's very hard to understand what belongs uh, um, in uh, th this data set. So we're going to uh, do a very pragmatic approach and um, it's an empirical, it's not a theory driven approach. Essentially we're going to go to the Dartmouth Atlas, pull down some variables and see if any of them correlate. Um, with, with, our, with our data set. So we coupled the 2008 data set for the Johns Hopkins um, data and we paired that with, uh, and we used lagged data um, from the Dartmouth Atlas essentially to prevent any reverse causation of uh, overuse causing, say for example, higher capacity um, or poorer quality in the healthcare system. So we're using that as our identify, identification um, strategy it's not the best identification strategy out there and more uh, a lagged model with panel data and full set of fixed effects and stuff like that could be a much better empirical strategy, but we're just essentially working off the one year uh, of data here. The variables that we're including um, uh, fall under the notion of capacity and we have some performance indicators. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of missing observations uh, that a lot of the data is not reported because of small cell sizes. Um, in the Dartmouth Atlas. So we're only using those indicators that are, have observable data in the Dartmouth Atlas um, for all of this. These include number of hospital beds, medical specialist surgeons, the number of medical beneficiaries, I'm sorry, Medicare beneficiaries, um, the total number of physicians, uh, the total number of hospital-based um, registered nurses, and as a quality metric, we use the percentage of uh, diabetics enrolled having tested their hemoglobin A1C within the one year, and that's a standard uh, measure. And remarkably, that doesn't have as much a ceiling effect as I thought. I thought that, that everyone met that, um, but there is actually some variation um, on that as a measure or a proxy for hospital quality. Here is the um, data um, that, that we have there, and essentially we've normalized this to 1,000 residents, except the number of, uh, uh, yeah, except for the percentage of people um, who are enrolled. That's only for the, the, the subset of people who actually have type 2 diabetes. Um, we see that there's some variation or sufficient variation. Um, we also see that uh, the sum of the there's quite a large variation in the size of the HHRs. Um, I was a bit surprised by the variation on that statistic. That statistic's quite often described as having a really bad uh, ceiling effect, um, but we actually don't hit the ceiling um, and have, it, have, the, have the range there that's quite plausible to, to use as a, a variable measure of hospital quality. This slide, um, I'm sorry, the label, this slide got made late because I changed the analysis a little bit. The first column presents the univariate analyses, or sorry, the bivariate analyses uh, between each of the indicators and um, the Johns Hopkins overuse index. The second column is uh, the multivariate um, analyses. If we look at the stability of this model, we see that a couple of these, there, there is a fair amount of multicollinearity. Whenever you do this type of analysis, we've got 306 observations and we could potentially have 400. If we use the area resource file, for example, we could bring in about 400 um, potential covariates for this data set. This is dangerous type of analyses to be doing. Uh, we tried to find a somewhat parsimonious model, um, but for example, the number of Medicare specialists is um, protective when done on univariate analysis, but when put in the multivariate analysis, for example, there we're holding um, constant the number of uh, total physicians, the total n number of nurses. When we account for that in the total number of medical Medicare beneficiaries, when we hold that constant, um, we see a reversal in the sign. But the other indicators, uh, particularly, um, I'm happy about the protective indicators um, all maintain their own sign and reasonable levels of st statistical significance. Uh, again here I'm testing the hypothesis, is anything correlated with the Johns Hopkins overuse index? And we find a set, uh, um, quite a plausible analysis and uh, 
we think that this has somewhat face validity um, with regards to, to, to thinking about that, that the supply and, and the um, specialist care was uh, exacerbating overuse and uh, the kind of measures of uh, routine or community care and quality were protective against overuse. So I'd say that uh, we do pass the test of identifying structural drivers of systematic overuse. Um, the number of hospital beds, medical specialists, surgeons, and the total number of medical beneficiaries all posed or were positively associated with greater systematic overuse. And then the systematic overuse was negatively associated with the total number of physicians, registered nurses, and the indicator that we use as a proxy for health system quality. So what do we hope, uh, well we hope for funding, um, I think all of us do these days, um, but uh, uh, throughout our research we think that this has provided an importance, you know, when we first started this, people, uh, we were very lucky that, that um, the Robert Wood Johnson took it up, um, but we've had uh, quite a, a great uh, deal of adversity to kind of convince even our own that this is a real thing that we're measuring. Um, and now that we show that there are structural determinants in addition to the other hypotheses that we've done, I think we start to make a more um, extensive um, criteria that, that this is actually true. In our future research, uh, we hope to extend this um, to other data sets, including those uh, younger than 65, uh, potentially using an all-payer data set within a state, maybe using a smaller unit of observation. Um, it would be great to consider some form of drug data, although there are some issues associated with other incentives such as co-payment structures and other types of variables, um, insurance coverage, etc., et that may not necessarily be associated with that because of the amount of efforts to, to ration or rein in drug, drug expenditures. Uh, we would very much like to use some causal model techniques here and um, Lucky that uh, Liz Stewart, uh, it, um, who is an expert on advanced uh, propensity score methods, uh, is, is at Hopkins. But again, we have to generate the data set to be able to do that. Um, and then uh, as any form of um, measurement technique, it's not just showing uh, that, that you can be correlated with what you want to correlate, but that this is responsive to an actual intervention. Um, and we believe that the uptake of accountable care organisations provide us with a very good, if they work, um, which we, we all hope that they do, um, but it would provide us with a good data set or a good hypothesis um, to test the predictive validity um, of the Hopkins Institute. And that's really been the focus of where we've been trying to get our future grant uh, um, our research from. Um, and again, th these are the publications uh, that, that we've been working on um, and we're currently working on this uh, fifth publication associated with the drivers. And again, this is un only the first time that I presented this work, so I'd be very open um, to, to your work. And then this is the Hopkins kind of motto, um, but the health economic students that I mentor sometimes uh, are, are modify this one, which is uh, protecting health. Um, uh, saving money millions at a time, but um, thank you very much. So, <clears throat> it's also very interesting hearing the, the kind of discipline approaches to these things, but, but basically, uh, you know, you being an economist, this is a very econometric approach to this, I mean, I, I, would, I would imagine sort of in trying to think about it, recasting it from a psychometric perspective, basically you develop a scale. Um, it's a scale of a bunch of items that reflect that this construct that you think is overused. Yeah. You used, a, you used a rash model or one, one parameter um, item response model basically to measure it um, and to see whether how well it distinguishes you know, hospital referral areas from each other. Um, and then you've done some, some construct that you've absent for sort of like criteria. <coughs>
Yep. Then that sort of pushes you back to the first step, which is what my question is, is the of content you want to be part of it. So you kind of went very quickly through this, you know, how you figured out 600 items and then from 635 and then it depends more. But it seems to me that that's kind of where you know, a lot of your exposure is criticism. Did you, you know, did you really sample from the construct space you know, trying to measure overuse? Is this Something about traditional and modern psychometric testing, but the, the key question is um, asking oh, these 20, what, what makes these 20 a, 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 a good 20? Um, we do think that the set of 613 at the time that we did the analysis uh, was reasonably exhaustive. We, we sent a, uh, we worked with, we worked within our systematic review group and I think that we did a pretty comprehensive uh, approach and we did hand searches with two uh, faculty involved and I think that we captured a pretty good set. Um, of course, the big jump of faith, way beyond the choosing wisely. Yeah, it, 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 at, at the time that we did this analysis, the, I think there were only 20 choosing wisely indicators. Um, and so uh, I did think Five of them ended up in our, in our final data set. So there is some overlap uh, with this approach. Um, and the fact that we could validate it just doing the choosing wisely in that first paper, the proof of principle was just off the choosing wisely and we get the same type of results. We've done ro robustness exercises. Of course, you're right that there might have been better indicators uh, of overuse um, because we had to focus on a patient population over 65 that they had to be identifiable um, in claims data. That's a big, that's a big jump there. And, um, but we wanted to avoid this other type of instance, which is um, with, with each individual, how, how we specify each individual measure, is that the right bar of overuse? And we could have done some sensitivity analyses um, to adjust for that, but the, the, the strength of our Cooled response here. It's, it's not, not like marginal inferences. The 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 robustness of our results. And we did do some sensitivity analysis, leaving indicators out one at a time. When we were working um, on the larger set of 35, um, taking out, for example, the uh, one of the screening variables because it was so common. Um, it was affecting the, the the larger index, and we were getting some slightly different. Relationships when we looked at the potentially 35 different submodels, just removing one at a time. That's why we think that the, the set of 20 is a more parsimonious set. It too is also robust to the deletion of, of, of one of the factors one at a time. I think most of the out of the 20 possible deletions, we get the same result with 19 of the uh, of the models. One of the other models is more ambiguous in sign than, than the final result. So we have some trust that that's there. We do think that this could be extended, um, but really what we're trying to do is, is get to this point that pooling is so, I, I was starting more with a classical testing theory, but I, but I agree, we've taken some of those, uh, we use um, students as a criteria to take out um, some of the indicators, but if we use you know, modern testing theory, they might be very good measures at some level of the, the analysis, but we really want to focus on proof of principle. Um, and, and prove that a, a portfolio of these could work and any error in specifying any one of them or any uh, misspecification uh, of the model was essentially adjusted for when we essentially put in the individual measure fixed effects um, for, for, for those. So we're holding constant the effect of each individual parameter on the model 
by itself in a, and only focusing on the systematic environment. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I asked a question about the selection of the 20th year in 1600 and whether or not we Yeah, um, thanks very much for that. The question was whether we should focus on uh, subsector. Um, you know, the, the, you could have overuse on um, radiology, but underuse on the absence of overuse on another indicator. We did uh, focus. We, we, there is a um, at the time that we did this, gastroenterology had done a pretty large review, and we had a number of measures there. ENT had done, cancer had done general medicine, community medicine, there is an absence of measures um, that, that, that are there and make, that make it difficult. Uh, again, since we've done this, the kind of choosing wisely and top 10 lists or top five lists by a vast majority of um, societies ha ha could, could do this. We did dabble um, with uh, some individual um, level models, such as a, like a cancer model. Um, but one of the questions that we had in the large data set that we had was, is, is that accurate enough and what would be the um, condition specific outcome measures? So we thought that one of our um, uh, masters or doctoral students would have taken that up. Um, but when we had such difficulty uh, getting the main papers published, <laughs> um, it's kind of like, uh, well, well, there goes, you know, we, we just thought it would have happened. Obviously, it, it is uh, something that needs to be validated. And now that there is a, you know, I, I would expect not just 600, that if you redid the analysis, you'd now find a list of, you know, twice that, if not more, of potential indicators. And you could generate uh, individual specific and also think about uh, even pediatrics versus gynecology versus um, geriatrics and think about that as being different patient populations. If they had correlation, that would be a great another set of proof of principle that a, a phenomena that could be found in a geriatric setting, if it was the same phenomena found in a pediatric setting, it might be a good proof of principle to show that uh, this is a reliable measure. Yes? So the HRR that you use is a construct based on a population use of the hospital. Yes. <coughs> Many of the things you're looking at are outpatient. They're not necessary to be done in the hospital. So why do you think the HRR is the right construct to, to aggregate your data? Um, in our future work, we plan not to use the HHR. It is one of the kind of debates that we were having is essentially how different is this from small area variation? And so one of the things that we wanted to do is use some of the vehicle. Um, we didn't want to, essentially it's a little bit of a me too strategy um, to, to kind of uh, focus in on using the same type of approaches and analytics that the Dartmouth uh, folks have done. Um, but we do believe that it holds up in, in, in other settings and our future work wouldn't, uh, be it a much smaller, something more like a metropolitan statistical area. Um, we we're just choosing our battles to fight uh, um, with, with, with regards to the, uh, what things we wanted to be novel and what things were, that we wanted to, to kind of just follow the traditional literature. Yes? You mentioned earlier that the list of 20 procedures that you came up with ultimately is partially informed by uh, you know, procedures that you can actually identify variables and claim data based on. Now my question is, I was looking at that list and you talked about wound culture and cabbage and CT of thorax, abdomen pelvis with IV contrast. Um, I'm trying to think that each one of those probably depends on multiple different variables. And how did you handle the issue of missingness? Because I think that, you know, when you would have to, for example, for someone, whether or not to assess whether the cabbage is appropriate or not, you have to look down and see the three vessel views, for example. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't there, then maybe it wasn't appropriate. But I'm just thinking that you're, you're, you're basically depending on multiple different variables for each individual to be present, I imagine, to make this you know, determination of appropriate versus inappropriate. For, for the, for the, the missingness issue, how did you get around that? 
the missingness issue was one of the criteria. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the question was, how did we get around missing data in specifying the indicators? Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the slides, uh, data that was unreliable or unavailable in claims data was used as a criteria to delete a potentially overused procedure. So of the 600, we got rid of some indicators that just couldn't be reliably identified um, in the data set. And uh, since we've used uh, clinical opinion and some uh, proprietary software to go in and learn how to specify these, what codes should you look for in, in um, doing that. And the codes, uh, I believe, are published as an appendix um, to the paper in 2014 in medical care. So if you wanted to go in and have a look at the exact way that we did it, it should be replicatable. Thank you very much. Great.